University President Rivka Karmi, not sitting where she's supposed to be sitting, <laughs> and Professor Tzvi Cohen, congratulations, sitting where he's supposed to be sitting, <laughs> and guests and friends, good afternoon and welcome to the annual Zlotowski Lecture. My name is Steve Rosen, Vice President of External Affairs, for those of you who haven't figured that out yet. We have a fantastic program planned for this afternoon. We will begin after the presentation of the Zlotowski Admission Awards for Outstanding Students, followed by a moving and thoughtful public reading by author Nicole Kraus, who will read from her latest yet unpublished work, uh, Forest Dark. I would like to begin by addressing the recipients of this year's Zlotowski Admission Award for Outstanding Students. This award is given only to the very best new students at BGU based on an average of their matriculation exam scores and their psychometric exam scores. The psychometric exams are equivalent to the SATs in the United States. This year the award was granted to a total of 156 students. Zlotowski students consistently prove that their award is well, uh, well deserved. They have maintained the highest grades at the departmental and faculty levels and often receive additional prizes for outstanding achievements. The percentage of Zlotowski students who pursue graduate degrees at BGU is significantly higher than that of other students. It's my pleasure to ask the students representing this year's Zlotowski Admission, Admission Awards recipients to stand up and be recognized. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, guys. The students, every year, get a year younger. <laughs> That's a really old joke, which also is indica indicative of something. Uh, <laughs> we have two recipients today who will speak on behalf of the larger recipient group. Uh, recipients Dana uh, Joskovic and Sajida Mahamid. Donna from the Department of Biology and Sajida from Medical Laboratory Sciences. I would now like to ask Donna and Sajida, who represent our Zotowski Award recipients, to join me on stage and say a few words. President Rivka Karmi, members of the Board of Governors, dear friends. Shalom. My name is Dana Joskovic. I'm from Jerusalem. I'm a first year student at the Department of Life Sciences. Salam. My name is Sajida Mohammed. I'm, uh, I'm from Moawiya, a small town near Umm al Fahim. I'm a first year student at the Department of Medical Laboratories. I was born in New York to a Mexican father and an Israeli mother. We moved back to Israel when I was three years old. Growing up, I was active in the Israel Scouts and was a counselor for both regular and special need ch children. The Scouts made me want to learn more about Israel society and to get involved. After high school, I, di I did a year of national service in the Ayalim movement doing contemporary Zionism. Not only working with weak population, but also populating existing settlements in the Negev and the Galilee and building them with our own two hands. That experience influenced my decision to study here in Be'er Sheva, the capital of the Negev. I came to BGU to realize a dream I had since I was six years old. Our teacher asked us questions about ourselves. I answered them all except for what I wanted to be when I grow up. The teacher said, why didn't you answer this question? Just write anything. And I said, but I don't want to be just anything. I want to do something that will leave a mark. I believe there's a lot of bad people in this world. And I want to be one of the good ones and help those in need. 
This is why I chose to study science. After my year of national service, I joined the Israeli Air Force and served as a flight simulator instructor in the School for Pilots. I volunteered to serve for three years instead of two as a part of the Women Just As Men Command, requiring that women soldiers serve the same amount of time as men in the IDF. This was really important to me. I believe in maximum equality for all genders in any society, both in duties and in rights. I grew up in a very strict society. I wasn't allowed to walk around outside and rarely saw my friends after school. I had to dress very modestly, even just dyeing my hair purple was a big rebellion. So many young girls, and even girls my age, suffer from a lack of self-confidence. I dyed my, my hair as a reminder not to care what other people think of me, because I believe in myself. My parents have always believed in me. They encouraged me to come to BGU and go after what I want. My, my relative will still ask me why I don't wear a hijab. But my relationship with God is strong and very personal. It doesn't have to show in the way I dress. I study life sciences because I believe that the future of the world depends on science. Not only expanding our scientific knowledge, but also living in a more careful and more conscious way to preserve this amazing planet Earth. In the future, I hope to promote sustainability and environmental activism. I visited all of the universities before deciding on BGU, and this was the only place that felt like home. Here at BGU, our teachers really make an effort to make sure we succeed. And I feel like I can accomplish anything. Our president, Rivka Karmi, empowers women and inspires us to be ambitious and break the glass ceiling. Before starting my studies, my only interaction with Jews was in seventh grade when our class went on a field trip and visited a Jewish school. Studying at BGU have changed my views. Once I got to know my Jewish classmates and made friends with them, we may have different political views, but the tension between us disappeared. After all, we're all humans. We all want a better future, and we all want peace, inshallah. When the decision where to study came up, studying in Be'er Sheva wasn't the obvious choice. But my love for the beautiful Negev region, my interest in supporting peripheral cities and communities, the vibrant communal student life, and the many doors BGU opens for you, and of course, the lower cost of living for students, all these factors brought me to BGU, and I know it was the right choice for me. I hope to continue to graduate studies and investigate the connection between physiological and mental illnesses. I want to say to young Arab girls, follow your dreams. When you're studying something you love, it pushes you forward. When you're doing, when you're doing your homework at 3 in the morning and you start feeling that maybe it's just too much, it can be very discouraging. You have to ask yourself, can I see myself doing this for the rest of my life? If the answer is yes, Keep going. Thank you, Susie, for believing in us. We promise to make our own contribution to Israel and the world. To them, to them kol kol alev. Thank you, Donna. Thank you, Sajida. Our students never fail to inspire me, and I assume that's the same of all of you. I would like to proceed to this. That's ad lib, by the way, Mark. Um, I would like to proceed to the second half of our program. This year, we are so very pleased to host the world-renowned Jewish-American author Nicole Krauss for a public reading. Mrs. Krauss, Ms. Krauss will read from, see now we have a mistake in this, will read, uh, we'll read from her yet unpublished novel, Forest Dark, which is scheduled to appear in September in New York. Her previous works include Man Walks Into a Room, The History of Love, and Great House. Her fiction has been published in The New Yorker, Harper's, Esquire, and Best American Short Stories. 
Her books have been translated into more than 35 languages and have reached readers from around the globe. I'm also pleased to be able to tell you that she just led a very, very successful class seminar with students in uh, the literature department. Please welcome our exceptional guest author for today, Nicole Krauss. Thank you very much, and thank you for inviting me here today. I'm happy to be able to read to you a little bit and talk to you, and it was lovely to hear the students and very inspiring. Um, so this is the new, new book that is coming out soon, and it's called Forest Dark. And I want to talk to you a little bit about some of the ideas and then read to you two separate sections from two parts of the book. In the Jewish account, God created the world out of language. In Genesis, the light follows God's spoken command for light. Utterance precedes existence. When light is divided from darkness, it occurs because light is given one name by God and darkness a different name, and the assignment of two distinct words creates a separation, creates two finite things out of what was infinite. The role of the alphabet is raised to a still greater level of import in Sefer Yetzirah, the book of creation, considered to be the most important early Agadic writing on the hidden meanings of the Genesis narrative. There, among other mystical theories of creation, the rabbis tell us that God created the world out of the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet, together with the 10 sephirot, the primordial numbers or powers associated with the attributes of God. So I'm reading now from that. He drew them, hewed them, combined them, weighed them, interchanged them, and through them produced the whole creation and everything that is destined to come into being. By means of the 22 letters, by giving them a form and shape, by mixing them and combining them in different ways, God made the soul of all that which has been created and all of that which will be. Never mind that it was the Phoenicians who developed the 22 letter alphabet and that what we consider Hebrew letters are in fact Aramaic descendants of the Phoenician system taken up by the Jews in their Babylonian exile. The idea holds. For the Jews, language is not merely descriptive, it is rather creative, imbued with the power to divide the finite from the infinite and transform the isn't into the is. The idea has a more general application. When children are encouraged to write stories in school, it's often said that they are being given tools to express themselves. But that's saying too little. The need for self-expression is only part of what compels the writer. Far more commanding is the need to grow that self, to deepen and expand it. What we do when we write stories equally as children or as adults is not express ourselves so much as create ourselves. We seize the chance to live other lives, actualize other choices, add more dimensions to our experience and to construct a coherent narrative we call for lack of a better word, a self. In other words, when we write stories, we're not simply expressing what we always were, what we always thought or felt. In our selection of words, we are choosing for ourselves who we are, who we want to be, and this is what connects writing so deeply to freedom. So I'd like to read you to begin with a small part of Forrest Stark that treats the idea of writing, in this case, Jewish writing, as a creative act. In this chapter, a writer rather like me, also named Nicole, is talking to Eliezer Friedman, who's either a retired professor of literature at Tel Aviv University or a former Mossad, or maybe both. He's asked to meet Nicole in Tel Aviv to, pr to propose a project he has in mind for her. And they're walking towards Spinoza Street, where Kafka's manuscripts have moldered for the last decades in a ground floor apartment owned by an elderly woman and her cats. That is true, as many of you know. Friedman be, uh, begins to introduce his proposal by speaking about the role of Jewish writers and the Bible as an act of collective self-invention. Friedman asked me whether I knew the country much, beyond Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. Had I been north to the Sea of Galilee or spent time in the desert? The landscape had astounded him as a child when he'd first arrived here. Reaching into one of his pockets, he produced 
a piece of terracotta and handed it to me. To walk into the setting of the Bible stories, to find what had been inscribed in his imagination corroborated by stone, olive tree, sky. The fragment of terracotta in my hands was 3,000 years old, he said. He picked it up not long ago in Kirbet Kiafa, above the valley of Elah where David slew Goliath. The ground there was littered with them. Some archaeologists argued that it was the biblical city of Sha'araim, that the ruins of King David's palace might be found there. A quiet place with wildflowers growing up through the stones and rainwater in the ancient bathtubs reflecting the silent clouds passing above. About this, they would go on arguing, Friedman said. But the fallen walls and the broken pots, the light and the wind in the leaves, it was enough. The rest would never be more than technical. No physical evidence of a kingdom had ever been found by archaeologists. But if Solomon's palace was the dream of a court historian, what did it matter in the grand scheme of things? David, who might have only been a tribal leader of a hill clan and brought, had brought his people to a high culture that had since given shape to nearly 3,000 years of history. Before him, Hebrew literature didn't exist. But because of David, 200 years after his death, Friedman said, the writers of Genesis and Samuel established the sublime limits of literature almost at its beginning. It's there in the story they wrote about him, a man who begins as a shepherd, becomes a warrior and a ruthless warlord, and dies a poet. Writers work alone, Friedman said. They pursue their own instincts, and one can't interfere with that. But when they're guided naturally towards certain themes, when their instincts and our goals converge in, a common, in common interests, one can give them opportunities. What goals do you mean exactly, I asked? To cast Jewish experience in a certain light? To put a spin on it in order to influence how we're seen? Sounds to me more like PR than literature. You're looking at it too narrowly, Friedman said. What we're talking about is much larger than perception. It's the idea of self-invention. Event, time, experience, these are the things that happen to us. One can look at the history of mankind as a progression from extreme passivity. Daily life is an immediate response to drought, cold, hunger, physical urges, without a sense of past or future, to a greater and greater exercise of will and control over our lives, and our destiny. In that paradigm, the development of writing represented a huge leap. When the Jews began to compose the central texts on which their identity would be founded, they were enacting that will, consciously defining themselves, inventing themselves as no one had before. Sure, put like that, it seems extremely radical, I said. But you could also just say the earliest Jewish writers were at the frontier of that natural evolution. Humanity had begun to think and write on a more elevated plane, giving people greater sophistication and subtlety in how they define themselves. But to suggest a level of self-awareness that would allow for self-invention, as you say, is assuming a lot about the intentions of those earliest writers. There's no need to assume, Friedman said with a shrug. The evidence is everywhere in the text, which of course are not the work of one or two individuals, but a series of composers and redactors who were supremely conscious of every choice they were making. The first two chapters of Genesis taken together are about exactly that, a meditation on creation as a set of choices and a reflection on the consequences that result. The very first thing we're given in the very first Jewish book is two contradictory accounts of God's creation of the world. Why? Perhaps because in echoing God's gestures, the redactors came to understand something about the price of creation something they wished to communicate to us that, if we were to grasp it, would verge on blasphemous, and therefore could only be hinted at obliquely. How many worlds did God consider before he chose to create this world? How many scales that contain neither light nor dark, but something else entirely? When God created light, he also created the absence of light. That much is spelled out for us. But only in the uncomfortable silence between those two incom incompatible beginnings is it possible to grasp that at that instant, he created a third thing, too. For lack of a better word, let us call it regret. Or an early theory of the universe, I said. Sorry, early theory of the multiverse. But Friedman seemed not to hear me. We stood at the corner waiting for the light to change. 
Overhead, the Mediterranean sky was stupendously blue, utterly cloudless. Friedman stepped out in front of an idling taxi and began to march across the street. Read closely enough, it's impossible to deny that whomever composed and edited those first texts understood what was at stake, he said. Understood that to begin was to move from infinity to a room with walls. That to choose one Abraham, one Moses, one David was also to reject all the others that might have been. That's the end of that section in the book. And to which I would add, speaking to you all, that the generative power of language, it's difficult freedom, is something that Jews have always understood, I think. And it's this more than anything that makes them the people of the book. The people who have emerged out of their own writing. Made in God's image, or at least as his counterpoint, we write possessed by the strange belief that we can push something into existence, that we can turn the isn't into the is. But if we were to follow the mystical line of thought, it bears asking the question that Isaac Luria or Ha'ari posed in the 16th century Svat. How does the infinite, the Ein Sof, the being without end as God is called, create something finite within what is already infinite? And furthermore, how can we explain the paradox of God's simultaneous presence and absence in the world? And his answer was that when it arose in God's will to create the world, his fir he first withdrew himself. And in the void that was left, he created the world. Tsimtsum was the word Luria had given to this divine contraction, which had been the necessary precursor to creation. This primordial event was seen as ongoing, constantly echoed not just in the Torah, but in our own lives. The idea of Tsimtsum has application not only to the creation of the world, but to any form of creation. It suggests that the first act of creation is not a mark, it's the nullification of the infinity that existed before the first mark. To make a mark is to remember that we are finite, it's to break or violate the illusion that we are nature that like the seasons goes around and around in a loop forever. But it's also a confirmation of our knowledge and freedom, which is all we have in this world and a confirmation of the generative power of language, which shows us the way back to the infinite. So I thought I would end by reading you uh, another short section from the book. Um, although I didn't know it at the time when I started, this is the very opening pages of Forest Dark, I was writing the story of uh, this character's own tsimtsum, his own contraction or withdrawal from the wor world to make space for something else. This chapter is called Ayeka. At the time of his disappearance, Epstein had been living in Tel Aviv for three months. No one had seen his apartment. His daughter Lucy had come to visit with her children, but Epstein installed them in the Hilton where he met them for lavish breakfasts at which he sipped only tea. When Lucy asked to come over, he'd begged off, explaining that the place was small and modest, not fit for receiving guests. Still reeling from her parents' late divorce, she'd looked at him through narrow eyes. Nothing about Epstein had previously been small or modest, but despite her suspicion, she'd had to accept it, along with all the other changes that had come over her father. In the end, it was the police detectives who showed Lucy, Jonah, and Maya into their father's apartment, which turned out to be in a crumbling building near the ancient port of Jaffa. The paint was peeling, and the shower let down directly above the toilet. A cockroach strutted majestically across the stone floor. Only after the police detective stomped on it with his shoe did it occur to Maya, Epstein's youngest and most intelligent child, that it may have been the last to see her father, if Epstein had ever really lived there at all. The only things that suggested he had inhabited the place were some books warped by the humid air that came through an open window and a bottle of the Coumadin pills he'd taken since the discovery of an atrial fibrillation five years earlier. It could not have been called squalid, and yet the place had more in common with the slums of Calcutta than it did with the rooms in which his children had stayed with their father on the Amalfi Coast in Cap Antibes. Though, like those other rooms, this one also had a view of the sea. In those final months, Epstein had become difficult to reach. No longer did his answers come hurtling back, regardless of the time of day or night. 
If before he'd always had the last word, it was because he'd never not replied. But slowly his messages had become more and more scarce. Time ex expanded between them because it had expanded in him. The 24 hours he'd once filled with everything under the sun was replaced by a scale of thousands of years. His family and friends became accustomed to his irregular silences, and so when he failed to answer anything at all during the first week of February, no one became instantly alarmed. In the end, it was Maya who woke in the night, feeling a tremor along the invisible line that still connected her to her father, and asked his cousin to check on him. Moti, who had been the beneficiary of many thousands of dollars from Epstein, got out of his bed, lit a cigarette, and stuffed his bare feet into his shoes. For though it was the middle of the night, he was glad to have a reason to talk to Epstein about a new investment. But when Moti arrived at the Jaffa address scrawled in his palm, he rang Maya back. There must be some mistake, he told her. There's no way her father would live in such a dump. Maya phoned Epstein's lawyer, Schloss, the only one who still knew anything, but he confirmed that the address was correct. When Moti finally roused the young tenant on the second floor by holding down the buzzer with a stubby finger, she confirmed that Epstein had in fact been living above her for the last few months, but that it had been many days since she'd last seen him, or heard him really, for she'd gotten used to the sound of him pacing on her ceiling during the night. Though she couldn't know it, as she stood sleepily at the door addressing the balding cousin, of her upstairs neighbor. In the rapid escalation of events, that, of events that followed, the young woman would become accustomed to the sound of many people coming and going above her head, tracing and retracing the footsteps of a man she hardly knew and yet had come to feel oddly close to. The police only had the case for half a day before it was taken over by the Shin Bet. Shimon Perez called the family personally to say that mountains would be moved. The taxi driver who'd picked Epstein up six days earlier was tracked down and taken in for questioning. Scared out of his wits, he smiled the whole time, showing his gold tooth. Later, he led the Shin Bet detective to the road along the Dead Sea, and following some confusion as a result of nerves, managed to locate the spot where he had let Epstein off, an intersection near the barren hills halfway between the caves of Qumran and Engedi. The search parties fanned out across the desert, but all they turned up was Epstein's empty monogram briefcase, which, as Maya put it, only made the possibility of his transubstantiation seem more real. During those days and nights, gathered together in the rooms of the Hilton suite, his children tossed back and forth between hope and grief. A phone was always ringing, Schloss alone was manning three, and each time it did, they attached themselves to the latest information that came through. Jonah learned things about their father that they hadn't known. But in the end, they got no closer to finding out what he had meant by it all, or what had become of him. As the days passed, the calls had become less often and brought no miracles. Slowly, they adjusted themselves to a new reality in which their father so firm and decisive in life, had left them with a final act that was utterly ambiguous. A rabbi was brought in who explained to them in heavily accented English that Jewish law required absolute certainty about the death before the morning rituals could be observed. In cases where there was no corpse, a witness to the death was considered enough. And even with no corpse and no witness, a report that the person had been killed by thieves or drowned or dragged off by a wild animal was enough. But in this case, there was no corpse, no witness, and no report. No thieves or wild animals, as far as anyone knew. Only an inscrutable absence where once their father had been. No one could have imagined it. And yet it came to seem like a fitting end. Death was too small for Epstein. In retrospect, not even a real possibility. In life, he had taken up the whole room. He wasn't large, only uncontainable. There was too much of him. He constantly overspilled himself. It all came pouring out, the passion, the anger, the enthusiasm, the contempt for people, and the love for all mankind. Argument was the medium in which he was raised, and he needed it to know he was alive. He fell out with three quarters of everyone he had fallen in with. Those that remained could do no wrong and were loved by Epstein forever. To know him was either to be crushed by him or madly inflated. 
one hardly recognized oneself in his descriptions. He had a long line of protégés. Epstein breathed himself into them. They became larger and larger, as did everyone he chose to love. At last, they flew like a Macy's parade balloon. But then one day, they would snag themselves on Epstein's high moral branches and burst. From then on, their names were anathema. In his inflationary habits, Epstein was deeply American. But in his lack of respect for boundaries and his tribalism, he was not. He was something else, and this something else led to misunderstanding again and again. And yet he'd had a way of drawing people in, bringing them over to his side under the expansive umbrella of his policies. He was lit brightly from within, and this light came spilling out of him in the careless fashion of one who hasn't any need to scrimp or save. To be with him was never dull. His spirit swelled and sank and swelled again. His temper flared. He was unforgiving, but he was never less than completely absorbing. He was endlessly curious, and when he became interested in something or someone, his investigations were exhaustive. He never doubted that everyone else would be as interested in these subjects as he was, but few could match his stamina. In the end, it was always his dinner companions who insisted on retiring first, and still Epstein would follow them out of the restaurant, fingers stabbing the air, eager to drive home his point. He had always been on top of everything. Where he lacked natural facilities, by sheer force of will, he drove himself beyond his limits. As a young man, he had not been a natural orator, but, for example, a lisp had gotten in the way. Nor was he innately athletic. But in time, he came to excel in these especially. The lisp was overcome. Only if one listened microscopically could a slur be detected where he performed the necessary operation. And many hours in the gym and the honing of a wily, cutthroat instinct turned him into a champion lightweight wrestler. Where he encountered a wall, he threw himself against it over and over, picking himself up until one day he went right through it. This enormous pressure and exertion was perceptible in everything he did, and yet what might come off as striving in anyone else in him seemed a form of grace. Even as a boy, his aspirations were gargantuan. At 13, he bought with his savings a blue silk scarf that he wore as casually as his friends wore their gym sneakers. How many people know what to do with money? His wife, Leanne, had been allergic to her family fortune. It stiffened her and made her quiet. She spent her early years trying to erase her footsteps in the formal gardens. But Epstein taught her what to do with it. He bought a Rubens, a Sargent, a Mortlake tapestry. He hung a Matisse in his closet. Under a ballerina by Degas, he sat without pants. It wasn't a question of being crude or out of his element. No, Epstein was very polished. He was not refined, he had no wish to lose his impurities, but he had been brought to a high shine. In pleasure, he saw nothing to be ashamed of. His was large and true, and so he could make himself at home among even the most exquisite things. Every summer, he rented the same shabby castle in Granada where the newspaper could be thrown down and the feet put up. He chose a spot in the plaster wall to pencil in the children's growth. In later years, he grew misty-eyed at the mention of the place. He had gotten so much wrong, he had made a mess of it, and yet there where his children had played freely under the orange trees, he had gotten something right. But at the end, there had been a kind of drift. Later on, when his children looked back and tried to make sense of what had happened, they could pinpoint the beginning of his transformation to the loss of his interest in pleasure. Something opened up between Epstein and his great appetite. It receded beyond the horizon a man carries within himself. Then he lived separately from his purchase of exquisite beauty. He lacked what it took to bring it all into harmony or got tired of the ambition to do so. For a while, the paintings still hung on the walls, but he no longer had much to do with them. They carried on their own lives, dreaming in their frames. Something had changed in him. The strong weather of being Epstein no longer gusted outward. A great, unnatural stillness settled over everything, as happens before radical events of meteorology. Then the wind shifted and turned inward. 
It was then that Epstein began to give things away. Thank you. Nicole has kindly agreed to um, answer any queries or questions you might have. Mm -hmm. Yes. To that. Uh, firstly, uh, I've read uh, some of your short stories and also a novel, which I enjoyed, so thanks. Mm -hmm. And when you started off telling us about the Nicole, someone with your name appears there, and the Professor Friedman may also be a member of the Shin Bet, it reminded me of another American novel mm. by Philip Roth, Operation mm. Shylock. Yes, well, he's written a, a blurb on the front here. Oh. <laughs> it says, a brilliant novel. I am full of admiration. Um, he, yes, Philip is a very good and old friend of mine, and I'm sure I had Operation Shylock in my mind to some degree. But um, this would take too long a time to answer. But um, as I said to him when we were talking about this book, I said, but you wrote fiction. This actually happened to me. Um, the beginning of your talk, or your book, uh, reminded me of the book you probably certainly know by Amos Oz and his daughter, Jews and Words. Hmm. I don't know that book, but I know both of those authors. Yes, but yeah. uh, the book is I'll really, really very interesting to read. For. I will look at it, thank you. And he's from a good university, of course. Yes. <laughs> he taught at a good university. I, I, I know this person or think I do, I can't wait until September. It seems way too long to have to wait. <laughs> so I'm very excited. Thank Good. you. That was an amazing um, characterization of someone we all know parts of, I think. Thank you. Yes. You know, when we met with the students earlier, you said that you're most commonly identified as a Jewish writer mm -hmm. rather than as a woman writer, as a, um, an American writer, mm -hmm. or something. So that your primary identity as a writer is as a Jewish writer. I was wondering if you would say something, and your presentation, I think, gives some strong evidence in that direction. Mm -hmm. Would you say something about your evolution yeah. As into a Jewish writer, or your development into a Jewish writer, because when I think of your first novel, Man Walks Into a Room, it's on the periphery of that Right, text. actually, um, the main character is only half Jewish, which was a concession. <laughs> right, and there, you know, there were one or two other indications as far as I recall, but, does it, yeah. but the question here is, how, how did it happen that over the years, your texts have become so much more thoroughly permeated by... Mm -hmm. Jewishness, or mm -hmm. that you ha and that you have become identified as a Jewish writer. Mm -hmm. Well, I think there are a lot of things. I mean, one is just the most obvious, which is that as you write, I mean, it, when it becomes a lifelong work, um, it's a it's a lifelong work not just of creating novels. The novels are the tangible form that we arrive at and can share. But the work of being a writer is this long work of trying to explore who you are and what you want to be and how you imagine the world. And, um, and the more you do that, the more inevitably, for better or worse, you get to know yourself. Um, and so I think when I wrote my first novel, I mean, I remember I was 25 at the time and I gave it to an older writer to read. And that novel is about somebody who loses their memory. And he said to me, well, of course you wrote about somebody who loses his memory. You're like, you're 25, nothing has happened to you yet. And so, you know, and, and I thought at the time, like, wow, so much has happened to me. But then I realized, like, he's right, like, nothing had happened to me yet. And, you know, and, um, and so I think there, there was just the beginning, in a sense, of that exploration. And the other thing I would say is that, um, and this is, I'm repeating now what I said to the students, but that if you would have told me when I was, you know, 15, 14, 15, 16, when I first really knew that I wanted to be a writer and couldn't imagine any other future for myself but that, whether or not I, it was going to happen, I didn't know. But I, if you would have told me, then you're going to become a novelist and you're going to become a novelist who is most often defined by 
being Jewish, I think it would have really sort of not just shocked me. I think I would it would have made me really uneasy. Largely because when you're, you know, when you're young and you're growing, the last thing you want is to be pigeonholed or defined. You're trying to throw off everything that that wants to define you. Um, so that would have made me uneasy, but it also would have made me uneasy because I I could find nothing to relate to in that. I mean, I grew up around in a Jewish family, around Jewish people, but but everything that they that the people around me represented was culturally Jewish and I didn't respond to it, it wasn't my own. And it was only as I got older and began to um, engage with Jewish texts and Jewish history and Jewish thought that I really got turned on and then I began to understand something far, I think, far deeper, far more at the heart of my being a Jewish writer than my having been raised Jewish, which is the understanding that in in those texts there is infinite flexibility, that those texts are some of the most radical thinking one can find still now, thousands of years later, and that, um, and that they, they, can, they push my mind to its far edges. Of, um, and and um, the other thing being that I, you know, I think this, this, we all joke about um, sort of Jewish argument and Jewish um, dissent and dissatisfaction, but I think this you know, idea which is sort of so much in the basis of our text, like in, you know, this notion that in the, in the Talmud it is considered a, f a failure by the rabbis when any argument finds resolution, that you are, the idea is to always keep the argument alive, that we are most ourselves, natively ourselves, when we are arguing a point that has infinite possibilities. I think that that to me was something that I could, that in, even in my most subversive self, I could grasp onto as something that was my own. Um, and so from there, it was just a, the sense of like, wow, how lucky a thing to be born into that this is my, this is my material, you know? And what a colorful people we are. <laughs> Thank you so much. It was a pleasure to... Uh listen to uh, the words that uh, you've written, already written down and already taking on meaning. But I, was, I really appreciated the way you started off mm -hmm. when you uh, talked about uh, uh, Sefi Yitzira and now listening to your responses, Sefi Yitzira is a book which itself searches for identity mm -hmm. because its meaning has changed over, uh, over the millennia. It didn't start out as a mystical book. Right, it, start, it starts out, in fact, the earliest theories about the book are that it's uh, uh, an early grammar of the Hebrew language, mm. right, where you have uh, uh, where, um, words of two, um, right, two uh, uh, the, the root of the word is, is of two letters, rather than as Hebrew develops and becomes mm. a, a three-letter right, three uh, root. And I thought it really beautiful that you talk about... Uh, uh, um, Right, the way that your writing defines your identity, and here you have a, a book which is mm -hmm. like so important in itself. Right, books themselves also search for mm -hmm. search for uh, uh, identity, and are very much dependent on who their readers are. Mm -hmm. And uh, I look forward very much to uh, you. reading your book. Thank, when you. In. thank you for having me, Nicole. Thank you very, very much on behalf of all of us. That was um, thought provoking and inspiring. I would like to, to conclude the annual Zlotowski event by thanking all of you here for being with us today and by expressing my gratitude for today's guest author and for sharing her thoughts and literary works with us. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.